Well, we're lucky enough to be, be here today in beautiful Cherokee, North Carolina, at the Cherokee School. And I would like to introduce to you today, Renessa. Sure. Totsua Dabadoa, Renessa McLaughlin. I, my Cherokee name is Totsua, which is Cardinal Redbird, given to me by my mother. I'm a member of the Deer Clan, as is my mother and my daughter and my two children. I am the manager of the Kadua Preservation and Education Program for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and you're sitting in the new Kadua, Isaiah Kadua campus um, for what we refer to as the Cherokee Language and Culture Campus for the Eastern Band. So um, we've been in operation since 2004. Had our uh, in April 19th. April 19th will be 13, 13 years since we opened our doors to our immersion program. We started with infants zero to six months. And we now have, um, went from one classroom, a 15 by 15 classroom, to a 32,000 square foot facility. So we've grown that fast. In, um, in five years, we had a building. One room, two rooms, three rooms, four rooms, and then in the fifth year, we had a building. So. What you have, what we have here at the tribe today, is what we is uh, the most aggressive approach to um, keeping the language as alive as possible. Can is through immersion and total immersion being um, researched as being the best and uh, most natural way of acquiring the language, as opposed to being taught the language with rote memorization, as you see in most language programs and uh, for foreign, modern foreign languages. We've been at this for um, 13 years, and even before that, Cherokee Central School Systems, which we're not a part of, um, have had some form of a language program for over 35 years. So, for over 35 years, the tribe was not very successful in creating speakers, and the immersion program uh, was researched, uh, a pilot program started. From that program, we graduated the first um, students last year who went on into public school, and we provide language maintenance for them. So over the life course of what we call the Gadoo Language Revitalization Initiative, we have developed um, immersion programs for early childhood, which are licensed by the state. Uh, a lot of people have different philosophy, philosophies about how education should take place as it pertains to language, and sometimes you're kind of stuck with them. Um, Anglo-American education is square, very rigid, and then the holistic views of Native peoples and the way that we, we love each other and how we are, you know, educating each other is more of a kind of a circular. So we tried to do our best to take the round peg and shove it into the square hole of the American education system and do the best that we can. Um, and a lot of programs across the country, you know, have the same struggles. Um, well, English-speaking kids are having the same struggles all across the country because um, a box cookie cutter education doesn't work. Cookie cutter education doesn't work for Native people, and especially doesn't isn't an environment that will foster a second language. Which you know, if you aren't born speaking your language, you're a second language learner, no matter how hard you try. So we we do that. And our initiative includes um, taking the speakers who were shy before and putting them in, uh, putting them on the pedestal that they deserve. And our speakers' age is over, average age is over 65 now. Um, and then we have a generation gap, obviously, because the generation of Cherokee speakers are over 60 plus and up. They're diabetic. Um, as are a lot of, you know, I think one in six, you know, the ratio is extremely high in Native communities. I so am too. Everybody, I mean, there's it's one in six, if not greater. And so we, um, if your audience is aware of what boarding schools do to Native peoples and um, to their languages, it, and you can research, you know, Captain Pratt and his famous statement was, kill the Indian, save the man. So with that type of mentality ruling the House of Education across the country for Native Americans, um, language wasn't important. Um, their, maintaining their language wasn't important. They were punished. It wasn't important. 
or in order to communicate with the people that were in the boarding schools, they had to learn English, um, or they made, they were made fun of. So what do you do when you're faced with, you know, you're faced with that kind of treatment? You don't hold on to that language, and you definitely don't pass it on to your children because you don't want them to be made fun of, or you see that they're not going to be um, economically successful in the white man's world. And so all of that happened over, you know, all of that happened from the time of occupation until we come into here now, and the millions of dollars and the millions of hours and the, and the, and the, number, and the years to wipe out native languages, um, we're lucky that we still have a generation of speakers still. I don't know how many lang native languages are left, indigenous languages are left in the country, but there's one indigenous language that dies, I think, every day, if not more, across the world. So what we're doing is making an extremely um, vigorous effort. It isn't the what I consider the best effort because we should we could be doing more but it's almost a little bit too late when it became okay to speak Cherokee and it became um, when we started raising you know raising the awareness and raising the alarm that hey did you realize that there's only this many people did you realize that in you know 2005 we had 700 speakers left and from that point to now we have about 260. So less than 1% of our population is uh, speaks Cherokee. So there's absolutely no amount of money right now that we could have. We could have a triple the budget. We could have 10 times the budget. I'm not sure if that's really going to be enough simply because it's almost a little bit too late. But a little bit is actually a lot because um, in 2005, before we started our initiative, you didn't hear people in the community saying hello to each other in Cherokee. You, um, you wouldn't have seen groups of speakers publicly using the language. Um, still kind of, I don't know, I, I, you know, kind of embarrassed or if it was just used privately in the home. So today we have, um, you know, some resurgence and pride in the language. You see syllabary signs about the you know, the boundary, or we don't live on the reservation. This is a boundary. It's called the Tribal Reserve. So, um, Federal Trust. And no, just the property you're on, no. not the town? The tribe. Okay. Yeah. We're, this is not a reservation. So, Cherokee history will tell you that um, the nation itself was removed. The government went with it. In the 30 years thereafter, we sat here in fear in our small communities all over this you know, all over. Um, I can't remember. I can't. I can't remember off the top of my head how many counties we're, we sit in. But there's a 30-year period after the removal that really is not talked about. The harrowing saga of the removal for Native peoples all across. You know, it it kind of took precedent. You know, it took the light, and then for 30 years that we're sitting here in the shadows with no real government, so to speak. We had to rebuild. Um, rebuild in what was left um, of our nation. And so the beautiful mountains that we're in here now is just a portion of, you know, the six, you know, the six states that we occupy. And so what we have now is, is beautiful, but we're grateful. Um, we don't live, this is not a reservation. Our land is held in trust. And from the, you know, from, from everything, it's, it's, we're here now to, um, we are encouraged to speak, and we're teaching. Um, we have K through six, kindergarten through sixth grade, early childhood, one year to five years, and um, we have adult immersion programs going on. Actually, they were meeting today. They meet every day. Um, we have a speakers consortium group where we have speakers from the Eastern Band, the Cherokee Nation, and the United Kaduna Band that meet on a regular basis to train. Um, stories, uh, revive old words, less, you know, you know, um, give those definitions of words because the language is so, um, it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's multidimensional, not like English. It's just kind of flat and plain. Um, Cherokee language is, you know, has all of these things that are contained in language and traditional values and time, and, you know, time and count and, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very difficult language to learn, so um, 
that's what makes this struggle even harder is that the language is just so complex. So when they start from a young age, it makes it a lot, it's a lot like English is a very difficult, or American is a very difficult language to learn too. Yes. Because every word has three or four ridiculous non-related meanings. Yeah, it, that's true, but it's very descriptive. So um, we have five verb, verb stems, and um, the conjugation is uh, nowhere near what English is or Spanish or uh, that. There's no way. There's no comparison. No comparison. And we do find that our adults are learning. Um, our, our adults are learning more um, complete, grammatically accurate, because we're applying all of the tools that we have developed through English. We have to compete with those languages. I mean, the, the way that we learn things. So we learn. We have a set of tools, and so we're very grammatically correct um, in, in the way that we try to speak. Okay. Now I'm going to pause here for a second.